It's okay. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Just, just got something in my, in my eye. <laughs> Hello, guys, and welcome back to Car Obsession. This week, I hit quite a large milestone. I am now 30 years old. Yes, that's right. My 20s are nothing but a distant memory just in the in the background over there perhaps anyway that aside something else has recently recently ish celebrated its 30th birthday and that is of course the mazda mx5 a car that i have a lot of love for in fact i've owned three since 2016 which speaks volumes and probably says i'm a madman that aside I thought I would prepare a buyer's guide for you guys. Now, of course, much of the world, including the UK, is in some form of lockdown. So restrictions are quite high. There's not much we can do at the moment. However, summer is, of course, fast approaching. So now could be a good time to start looking at buying a used Mazda MX-5. I completely understand that buying a car, whether it's brand new or used, is going to be very difficult in these current conditions but hopefully restrictions will be lifted bit by bit and we, we can all be out in our mx5s with the roof down sun, sun shining and just having a good time in life before i go any further i do want to disclose that this video is primarily well i say prim primarily it is only focusing on the mark one the mark two and the mark 2.5 so if you're looking to buy a Mark III or a Mark IV, I'm afraid this video won't be of any help to you. The MX-5 is practically Japan's answer to the classic British sports car. And in fact, I have had some people mistake my Mark I for an MG because it has got that very almost quintessential British look to it, only it's much more reliable than an MG. So you kind of get the, the best of both worlds. I think that's why they've become so popular. That and also they are fantastic value for money, but I will get onto that in a little bit. So the Mazda MX-5 first hit the scene in 1989, which of course was the Mark I. That was produced from 1989 all the way through to 1998, so quite a long production run. Um, and it didn't really have a facelift as such, much like the Mark IV. The Mark IV hasn't really had a facelift in regards to styling. It's just had a few technical tweaks here and there. The Mark II, that was produced from 1998 until 2001, which leaves the Mark 2.5, which was produced from 2001 and 2005. No matter which generation you go for, in regards to the Mark I, the Mark II and the Mark 2.5, you will have a choice of either a 1.6 litre naturally aspirated petrol engine or a 1.8 litre naturally aspirated petrol. Mazda did do in small numbers some turbocharged models, so for example, you've got the BBR Turbo or the, the Mon Edition, but you have to bear in mind that these will be quite hard to come by on the used market. And if they are in any kind of decent condition, they will be quite expensive. Speaking of expensive, just out of pure curiosity, I had a look at Auto Trader to see what was the most expensive Mark I. And I came across one which I've actually seen before because I wrote an article about it about two or three years ago. And this dealership wants almost £20,000 for it. I love MX-5s, but I don't think I could spend that much on a used one. It is worth noting that this MX-5 in particular is a Yunos Roadster, so it is a Japanese import, and it's covered only 3,000 miles, and it is an S-Special, which um, is one of the uh, special editions. I actually have an S-Special Type 2, but yes, it just gives you an idea of just how expensive they, they can go for. But that isn't really a good barometer because you can pick them up for very reasonable money. Now, going back onto the engines, no matter which engine you go for, whether it's the 1.6 or the 1.8, you should find it is pretty much bulletproof so long as it has been serviced properly. And oh yeah, when you drive it hard, don't let it run out of oil. But come on, what kind of idiot would do that? Never mind, moving things on. Of course, make sure that the cam belt or the timing belt has been changed at the correct intervals as well, because you don't want to buy a car, realize that it is overdue, and then have to fork out more money to get that done. For what it's worth, the MX-5 engine is a non-interference engine. So if the cam belt were to let go on you, it wouldn't destroy your engine. Um, you'd have a loss of power, but it's still better to avoid that happening in the first place. 
but if the cam belt does go it won't be as catastrophic as it can be in other cars but i'm not saying let the cam belt go because that wouldn't really be very good advice in regards to the engines there is two things worth noting firstly for later versions of the mark one the 1.6 litre engine offered less power so instead of around 110 brake horsepower it offered 90 brake horsepower and for the mark 2.5 the 1.8 litre engine was revised and the svt engine came into place which had a bit more power and it had a variable valve timing the gearboxes like the engines should be pretty bulletproof as well although i have read somewhere that the six speed manual offered in the mark 2.5s can be a little bit chocolatey so i'm not too sure on that one i've not owned a six speed manual myself so i can't speak from personal experience the majority of the cars on the used market will have a five speed manual if you want an automatic you can have one i think it's a four speed automatic but i would only urge you to get an automatic if you really have to have one an mx5 in my eyes has to have a manual gearbox manual for the win this five speed manual gearbox is a fantastic tool in which to change gear so if you do go out on a test drive and you find the the gear gear change is a bit notchy or a bit sticky then there may be something wrong with the synchros or there may be some kind of underlying issue there the the changes should be short snappy and slick if they're not it's a potential problem there if you do happen to be looking for an auto then i would recommend that you have a look at a mark one because trying to find an automatic mark 2 or mark 2.5 is quite difficult and one good thing about the automatic versions is that they are normally cheaper because of course they are less desirable compared to the five speed manual so if you want to save yourself a bit of money you could go down that route although i would still stick with a manual in regard to which engine is better the 1.6 or the 1.8 this is a debate that will wage on until the end of time so i would thoroughly recommend that you go out and if possible have a go in both i've owned the 1.6 and the 1.8 many say that the 1.6 is more free revving which it is but i personally prefer the 1.8 it has more power it feels a bit more meaty there's a bit more oomph in the mid-range and particularly for motorway driving i know mx5s aren't really designed for motorway driving but i do drive on the motorways now and then i find the 1.8 is a better cruiser than the 1.6 but i suppose that is a silly thing to say because it has more power so it will be the better out of the two but i just prefer the 1.8 that's but that's my personal opinion like i say i would thoroughly recommend that you have a drive in both because you may prefer the 1.6 or you may prefer the 1.8 try not to let other opinions or people influence your decision not only do you have the choice of engines or gearboxes but diffs as well where possible i would urge you to get a car that has an lsd no 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 not that kind of lsd i mean limited slip differential this will give you better traction in the corners and this will be more beneficial if you want to use the car for track days or maybe even for drifting of course if you want to do drifting you can look at a welded diff which makes it easier to skid but they're not that great to live with uh, believe me and also they're not that great on track days either not unless you want to spend most of your time flailing at the steering wheel so you're pointing in the right direction of course you can look at a car that has an open diff and that would be a cheaper way to go but where possible i would urge you to get the limited slip differential i just think you'll get more out of the mx5 experience Oh, ice cream van. He's a bit optimistic in lockdown. Who's going to go out for an ice cream in lockdown? Well, I must admit I'm tempted, but I won't. He stopped. He's clearly got he, he's clearly got the hint that he's got no no punters. Um, where was I? I've lost my train of thought. Thank you, ice cream van. Um, limited slip differentials. So where possible, get a car that has got one. However. It's not quite as simple as that because throughout the lifespan of the Mark 1, the Mark 2 and the Mark 2.5, Mazda offered three choices of limited slip differentials. So for the Mark 1, for the 1.6 litre version, there was the viscous LSD, which out, out of the three options for limited slip differentials is known to be the weakest one. And that is um, highlighted by the fact that you can pick up a used viscous LSD on eBay for next to nothing. 
So it was fitted to some versions, so some UK versions of the 1.6 and all of the Japanese versions of the 1.6. So that's the viscous LSD. You then have the Torsen LSD, which is regarded as pretty much everybody to be the best limited slip diff you can get for the MX-5. That was fitted to the 1.8 litre version of the Mark 1, the Mark 2 and the Mark 2.5. All of the Japanese versions got the Torsen limited slip diff and there's actually two types. You have a type 1 and a type 2. I think the type 2 is a little bit better. But in the UK, not all of the 1.8 litre versions got a, a Torsen limited slip differential. So again, make sure you do your research because you don't want to buy a car thinking it has an LSD when it doesn't. You don't want, you don't want to get stung. So that's the, um, the um, Viscous and the Torsen. That leaves the Super Fuji LSD, which was used on later versions of the Mark 2.5. I think it was used from 2003 onwards. That was fitted to some UK versions of the 1.8 and all of the Japanese versions of the 1.8. So as you can see, there's a theme running here that the Japanese cars are normally a better specification, but I will get onto that a little bit later. So in regards to the limited slip hier hierarchy, I suppose, if there is one, so you have Torsen at the top, Super Fuji in the middle, and then uh, Viscous at the bottom. I don't know why I'm doing that because you can't see that. Sorry, here we go. Torsen, Super Fuji, and um, Viscous. The MX-5, it has the engine at the front, power fed to the rear with a 50-50 weight distribution, which is of course a winning formula for petrol heads, but a winning formula for Mazda as well. Since production started in 1989, the Japanese company has been able to shift over a million MX-5s, which has made it the best selling roadster <clears throat> in the world. So needless to say, Mazda knows a thing or two about making a good roadster and the great thing is is that you can have one of these sporty little cars you can get one for five five thousand pounds and receive much change they are really really good value no they aren't the fastest cars in the world but the mx5 has never really been about speed they're about poise balance the chassis the handling and insert mx5 cliche buzzword here in regard to what to look out for there's not really that much, apart from, oh yeah, rust. These cars are notorious for rust, and it is a big problem for these little cars. Apart from that, there's not really that much to look out for. Of course, make sure the car's got good service history, and that you're buying it from someone who appears to be reputable. Make sure that you've done your research if you're buying it from a dealer, and always do your HPI checks and that kind of jazz. No one wants to get stung when buying a used car. In regard to looking for rust, this affects all of the Mark 1s, the Mark 2s and the Mark 2.5s. So don't think that one generation is going to be better than the other. Although there are some people that say that the Mark 1 normally fares better for rust compared to the Mark 2 and the Mark 2.5. That's probably because when the Mark 2 was made and the Mark 2.5, at the time, safety regulations were starting to get more stringent. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons why the pop-up headlights disappeared. Because if you have pop-up headlights and you hit a pedestrian, I imagine that is going to be quite painful for said pedestrian. That's why the Mark II and the Mark 2.5 and indeed all of the, the MX-5 since the Mark 1 have lost those iconic pop-up headlights. In fact, I've got pop-up headlights on my t-shirt there. Um, and pop-up headlights on Monique, which you probably can't see on my um, computer screen. Oh, do you like that, by the way? That was one of my gifts for my birthday. Probably a very cheap present, but I really like it. Uh, I think it's, uh, anyway, I digress. So Rust, I went on a tangent, I do apologize. So with the Mark II and the Mark 2.5s, because of the change in the, in the, in the chassis, not only do they rust at the rear, but they rust at the front. They rust at the uh, chassis rails, which I know all too well. So that, that's what—that's pretty much what killed off my Mark II Sport. It's okay. I'm, I'm fine. I'm, I'm good. I'm good. Just, just got something in my, in my eye. <laughs> There's one area that you really need to focus on when you're looking for rust, and that is the rear wheel arches and also the rear seals. That is pretty much the number one place where MX-5 
will rust. If you see paint bubbling, that is the sign that the rot has started because the cars love to rot from the inside out. One of the advantages of the MX-5 being so renowned for rust is there are many specialists that can do welding repairs. But just make sure that the place you take the car to is reputable. Yes, a place may, may seem cheap, but why is that? So the way how I like, like to look at it is sometimes it's better to pay more to get the job done once and done right. One place I would recommend for rust repairs or I suppose any other MX-5 based work is the MX-5 Restorer. They are based not too far from Eastbourne so if you're on the south coast of England be sure to give those guys a look. They did a fantastic job on my Mark 1. Very good job. It did cost a bit more than I had anticipated but that's because the job took longer because my Mark 1 it turns out is full of expanding foam which is highly flammable and when you've got a welding torch and something that's highly flammable in very close quarters to each other you have to be careful so that's why the job took longer because they had to make sure that my precious Monique didn't just simply combust into a ball of flames which would have been tragic for me. Now of course you want to get a car that has as little rust as humanly possible so when you are looking for a car where you can try to find one that has been garaged or one that's been cherished or looked after alternatively you can also look at a Yunus Roadster a, a Japanese import as that would have spent a, a long time well a fair chunk of its life in Japan and therefore it's less likely to be rusty I actually have a Yunus Roadster myself um, I probably mentioned it earlier I've got a Yunus Roadster S Special Type 2 and she is wonderful she really is and a great thing about the Yunus Roadsters is that normally they have a better specification than what the UK models get. So not only are you likely to get a car that has less rust, but it, it will probably be a better, a better specification as well. My car's got air conditioning, central locking, um, it's got electric windows, which may seem quite insignificant, but for, for a convertible that is, oh, how old is she now? Over 20 years old, that's actually pretty good. Of course, my car's got a limited slip differential as well, and it's also got the, um, the, oh, what's it called? I can never remember the name, the Mazda Sensory Sound System. So in essence, it's got speakers and, and the headrests, which is quite a nice touch, particularly when you're driving with the roof down, it means you can hear, hear your, your favorite tunes better. So I do quite like that touch. Miata MX-5 Roadster, whatever you want to call it, it is a simply fantastic car that offers brilliant value. It really does, you can pick one up for less than a thousand pounds. Okay, it will be quite a tatty example, but it's difficult to think of what other cars you can buy for that amount of money that can offer so much fun. That's our rear wheel drive at least. Um, so I'm a massive, massive fan of the MX-5, big up the MX-5, um, and I have no problem in recommending one to anyone because they are fantastic cars. And what I, what I love about the MX-5 is that it doesn't discriminate. It doesn't really have your typical buyer. It's got such a vast audience, old, young, men, women, rich, poor. What I love is it's just, it's, it is a very accessible car. And the MX-5 community is great as well. So if you do buy an MX-5, or maybe you're watching this and you actually have an MX-5, which doesn't quite make sense because why would you be watching a buyer's guide when you have one? But that aside, I would recommend that you join the Mazda MX-5 Owners Club. Lovely bunch of people. Uh, I'm sure you will be welcomed with big open arms, but no hugging because two meters and all that. For those of you that are looking to modify your MX-5, good news for you is that that is something that is easy to do and, and, and at a rather reasonable price as well. There are plenty of places that sell aftermarket parts for the MX-5 because they are popular cars to modify. However, if you want to keep it standard, and you, or maybe you're looking to restore an MX-5. Again, there's there's plenty of places where you can buy MX-5 parts, one of which is actually called MX-5 parts. Um, so that if you want to buy it as a project, which I think quite a lot of people do, then there's plenty of support out there, not only from retailers and um, part suppliers, but the community as well, whether it's Facebook groups or the owners club or forums, there's a lot of knowledge out there. There's a lot of, lot of um, there's a lot of advice you can you can get in regard to 
doing your MX-5 up. Now, although lots of people modify them, that's not to say they can't be enjoyed in standard form. And if you're looking to buy one as an investment, then your best bet is to keep the standard. I wouldn't say the Mark 1s have appreciated that much uh, in the recent times, but who knows where we could be in 10 or 15 years time. So you never know, if you happen to have a near mint condition MX-5 in your garage, look after it. It might be worth something one day. Hopefully you found this buyer's guide useful. I think this has been more of a love letter to an MX-5 than a buyer's guide. But in short, just make sure the car's been serviced properly. Get a limited slip diff if you can. Go for a manual. I would urge you to go for a Mark 1 just because they're cooler. They've got pop-up headlights and Mark 1s hold a very special place in my heart. Um, and of course, look for rust. Yes, rust, rust, rust. That is your enemy. You need to make sure that the car you get has as little rust as possible as it will save you money and a nightmare in the future, providing that um, you can keep the, you can store the car in the proper, correct manner. But if you have found this video useful, um, please do give it a massive thumbs up. As always, like, subscribe, comment if you want to. Click that bell icon if you are subscribed so you, so you get notified every time I make a video. But until the next time, guys, be sure to keep up the car obsession.